Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for The Battle of the Giants, an episode of Mask produced by Deke. So over here in the UK we had a lot of Mask episodes released to VHS, and I mean a lot. However, something odd happened in the 80s. Even though I would be a lifelong fan of Mask, the cartoon and the toy line's popularity died in the UK. Around about 1988, four new VHS tapes were released over here in the UK that had previously been released in the US. These videos were released by Golden Book Video, who interestingly rarely released any videos in the UK, so these were, you know, very unique. The episodes on these four volumes were from the short-lived season two of Mask, which this episode is one of. And by short-lived, I mean 10 episodes, very short season. I should stress that in the UK, we never had season two shown on terrestrial TV. Actually, the more I think about it, we never even had season one repeated in the UK. It had one airing and that was it. So as I said, these Golden Book releases were from the somewhat infamous season two. Why infamous? Well, season two was a departure from the much celebrated season one. The episode structure of a first season episode played like a true action adventure drama in which the heroes had to stop the criminals from succeeding in their latest plan to conquer the world. Season two is just not like that in the slightest. This season sees the heroes and villains racing one another. Yes, racing. Yes, they have battles, but the premise of each episode has the heroes of Mask and the villains of Venom trying to win a race. And that's not all the changes they made this season, but we'll get to those. Many fans do not like these episodes. Me, I like them, and I think that's a nostalgia thing. I can still remember in 1988 getting the first of these VHS tapes, and I can explicitly remember watching these episodes. Also, I should say that sometimes you see the second season referred to as the lost season. It's never really been lost, it just aired once and a lot of people forgot about it. And now we get our first look at the cast. And yeah, here we see Matt Tracker and one of my favourite characters of the series, Jacques Lefleur. Our first look at their new costumes, I say new costumes, Jacques Lefleur is there in all his traditional glory, but Matt Tracker is now in his Goliath uniform, supported by a new addition to the team, Nevada Rushmore. Venom can't figure out what we're doing if we don't know ourselves. When you're up against those guys, it can pay to be unpredictable. And we're about to see the villains. This VHS, which had the episodes Battle of the Giants and The Battle for Baja, was the first time I saw these vehicles and characters. So you can imagine my confusion when we suddenly see two Miles Mayhems with no explanation. Technically, although you'll sometimes see it listed as the last episode of the season, the episode for One Shining Moment is clearly the first episode of the second season because there is a transition of sorts and the beginning of the racing season premise. So go and check that episode out if you ever get the chance because that is clearly the beginning of this brief season. Even though this episode, like so many of Mask, has never received a decent digital transfer, it's actually one of the best animated episodes of the season. Though the episode High Nude would probably win that award, even if that particular episode is littered with mistakes. This scene is kind of symptomatic of the problems this season would face. Sometimes scenes just didn't make sense. Like here, Mayhem says that when Mask move, Venom must strike. But Mask just drive off? and Mayhem is angered that he was outplayed by Tracker, and we're left thinking, wait, what? How was, how was he outplayed? And listen to this line coming up from Matt Tracker here. Oh, Miles, you angry with me? Oh, Miles, you angry with me? This season, there's a real difference to the way Matt Tracker is written. Maybe it has to do with Scott and T-Bob messing or something, but Matt Tracker is slightly cocky, a little arrogant at times, and some of his dialogue, it just feels like it was written for other characters. I don't know why the Mask team deduced that kangaroos may know a shortcut. What kind of logic is that when you're in an actual race? <laughs> so bizarre. Ah, oh, Volcano, Jacques Lafleur's Mask vehicle. I loved this toy as a kid. I was fortunate enough to get that and Outlaw, which was like the corresponding villain vehicle back in the day. I believe I got Volcano for my birthday in August and Outlaw for Christmas, so yeah, Christmas was great because I could play with two of the biggest Mars vehicles at that time. And speaking of toys, and my birthday, in 1988 I got Goliath and Buzzard. There's even a photo of me on holiday in Devon with those vehicles. Maybe I should post that at some point. 
Goliath and Buzzard were great, as were most of the vehicles from this racing season. And I should stress, the reason this racing season was created was to promote the latest line of mask toys, which were based around racing. So the cartoon really was there to advertise this product, and it did a great job. What I loved about Goliath and Buzzard in particular was that they were two vehicles in one. And I know you can say that about a lot of the mask vehicles, but Goliath had a race car and a truck, both transformed and did their own thing. Buzzard separated, as you'll see in this episode, you had two sidecars and a jet. I mean, the, the creators of the Mars toys really did let their imagination run wild and create some wonderful things. I love Nevada Rushmore. I think he's my favorite of the new characters in this series. I love the design of his mask, although I think they could have been a tad more creative with his mask's ability. He's a Native American Indian, and so his mask has the ability to fire out little totem poles. One could argue that the mask pays homage to his heritage. The episode Cliffhanger, if I remember rightly, delves into the history of his tribe. In season two, you'll hear in the dialogue characters being given nicknames. This was something that season two seemed to relish in. Matt Tracker was cowboy, Nevada was chief, Jacques Lafleur was Trailblazer, Floyd Malloy was Birdman, something he actually explains in a season two episode. He says to Vanessa Warfield, call me Birdman, I hate the name Floyd, something that had never come up in any of his season one appearances. And the nicknames were something that was in the original Mask series Bible. Alex Sector, whose mask was Jackrabbit, his code name was Megabyte, for example. The UK Mask Annual, featured all the code names of the mask agents, at least that initial wave of mask agents. Going back to that initial setup we saw of the heroes and villains preparing to enter this race, even as a kid I remember immediately wondering why the mask team weren't wearing those masks. So this is one of the biggest changes the series made in season two. In season one, the Venom agents never knew who the mask agents were, never knew their identities. The funny thing about that is, in the comics, in certain mini comics that came with certain toys, in the lengthy UK comic, all of these canons had the Venom agents know full well the identity of the mask agents. So it was something in season one that the cartoon did that was unique. It kept the mask agents a secret, and that was kind of and that was kind of a really interesting thing because the mask agents would always have to make sure that in battle they had their masks on as to not compromise their identities. And there's no explanation for this. And the, the interesting thing about season two, as I'm sure I'll talk about in another video, is that it really began to steer itself towards the other canons. In the other canons, even at the beginning in the comics, it was stated that Miles Mayhem was largely responsible for creating Mask in the first place. And then obviously branching out and becoming a terrorist organization in Venom. But the cartoon never ever addressed that. In season two, in that previous episode I mentioned for One Shining Moment, it is explicitly mentioned that Miles Mayhem was partly responsible for helping create Mask. And that's the one time the cartoon actually acknowledges that. So why then, for the first 65 episodes of this cartoon, does Miles Mayhem never figure out that his former co-creator of Mask, Matt Tracker, is now the leader of Mask? It's weird, this second season really does kind of wreck on everything and even create a lot of confusion. It is nice to see, you know, the characters without their masks facing off. That was always the good thing about the comics. But the first season really did kind of celebrate the idea that the mask agents were a mystery to Venom. Who are these men in masks? Who are they? I mean, the racing season must have been a nightmare for the writers. I say writers, only two are credited with these ten episodes. And I'll speak about one of them later. The reason I say nightmare is because every episode was a race of some sort and the winner wouldn't just get a trophy, but the trophy would contain a microfilm or a secret or something or the other. Or in the episode where Eagle's there, they're racing for the transportation rights to traverse a country. And if Venom win those rights, they'll have free reign to transport who knows what. It's bizarre how the series shifts so dramatically. Not just the structure, but Venom go from being a terrorist organisation that Mask must stop at every turn to a rival racing team. And Mask no longer need to summon their agents into action. That's gone. I mean, that was one of the really exciting parts about the first season when Matt Tracker would open his briefcase or sit in front of his computer and summon the relevant agents to this particular mission. And you'd be sitting there thinking, oh, who are we going to get? Is it Alex Scepter, Bruce Sato, Dusty Hayes, Calhoun Burns, Ace Riker, Jacques Lafleur, whoever. It's always very exciting. That's all gone this season. People are just 
the cast are just usually standing around when the episode starts. That's not an exaggeration. A lot of the time the characters are standing there talking and that's where the episode begins. One of the most glaring changes this season made was the removal of Scott Tracker and T-Bob who were in every episode of the original season and played a small but intricate role in each and every episode. Their absence is noteworthy because yeah I mean I understand from a storytelling point of view it doesn't make sense for Scott and T-Bob to try and keep up with these races. It would make no sense whatsoever but their absence is just so bizarre. I would love to see a season two Bible for this, but alas, I don't think we'll ever get to see that. I spoke to Jack Oleska years ago, probably in the early noughties, and I've known Jack Oleska, I met him a couple of times from his work on the New Adventures of He-Man series. He was the primary writer for that series. And for this season of Mask, he was, as I mentioned before, one of two writers, the other one being Ray Dryden. Jack Oleska, when I spoke to him and I talked about Mask, he had vague recollections about writing for it. And when I mentioned season two, the one thing he remembered was that they had to turn around these scripts so quickly. And you do get the sense that some of these scripts are rushed. There are some moments, as I mentioned earlier, with Miles Mayhem saying, when they move, strike, and then they don't do anything, and then it's supposed to be a weird plan. And here we are, heading to an act one end break with a great shot of Miles Mayhem doing an evil laugh. There's an episode, High Noon, which I've already mentioned is one of the best looking episodes of the season, riddled with mistakes, but still one of the best looking episodes. That episode has such a confusing plot. I'll hopefully do a commentary on that at some point, but you will be baffled trying to figure out the plot of that episode. And you do think if you're given a week or so to turn around a bunch of scripts, there might be elements where mistakes are made. And here we are in Act 2. I do love this little bit of the plot. Even though Venom are winning the race, Matt knows that Miles will do his best to eliminate the masked team before winning. So Matt knows that Venom will not make it to the finish line first because they will come back to try and eliminate Mask. It's a great little twist to the story. The good thing about this season is that the vehicles do take a considerable amount of damage. Yeah, there was damage to the vehicles in the original, with Firecracker being written out of the series and Thunderhawk being trashed numerous times. But there was something different about the way the vehicles would be battered in this second season. So here, we're about to see Jacques Lafleur use his Mirage mask. And now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that in season one, Mirage, the mask, would make he and his vehicle invisible. Never really gave it too much thought. However, in season two, in this episode here, Mirage does what you would expect it to do. It creates mirages. So here, Jacques Lafleur creates a mirage of the finish line, prompting Floyd Malloy to rush ahead, and so Jacques can gain the advantage by, you know, eliminating him, as it were. But it's so funny that they just changed the idea behind the mask, and I guarantee that wasn't the writers looking at season one and thinking, hmm, let's change that. I guarantee they were looking at the series Bible. It said Jacques Lafleur's mask mirage does this and I can imagine that the series Bible does explain that the mask was used to create mirages that's what the, the clues in the name right Floyd Molloy pops up in a couple of season two episodes my problem with him is that he's written as a bit of a moany wimp in season one he's a little more cutthroat like a businessman constantly talking about money whereas the other Venom agents just appear to be there to do their job Floyd does seem to be exclusively in this, not for world domination, but just to line his own pockets. Same with Bruno Shepard. Bruno, in season two, pops up a few times. He's written as a brainless brute. Whereas in season one, he was a big guy, but he was intelligent. I even remember in one episode, Bruno educating Cliff Dagger that snakes don't hear. So Bruno clearly knew his stuff. I think the reason Bruno is written as a brainless brute this season is because Cliff Dagger is gone. Cliff Dagger was very prominent in season one as part of the Venom team, and he was the henchman, the brainless brute, as it were. With him not in this season, it's up to someone to fill that role, and in this case, it's Bruno Shepard. Actually, thinking about this episode, Matt Tracker's new mask, Shroud, creates a purple cloud which people cannot see into. Brad Turner, who shows up a great deal in this second season, his new mask is Eclipse, which creates a black cloud which people cannot see into. Not sure I never thought about that before. Like, 
two new masks with exactly the same power. Because I hadn't seen the toys yet, I had no idea what Mayhem's new mask was. We had Viper, which was a mask he used with Switchblade, Python, a mask he used with Outlaw, this one, Flexor. Flexor, such a strange name for a mask. The mask creates an impenetrable, flexible shield of sorts. But to call it Flexor, that's so weird. I remember as a kid thinking it was called Blixer. Because listen to the way Miles says it in this episode. It's like, Flexor, on! And when I eventually got the figure, I was like, Flexor? At least Maximus Mayhem, his twin brother's mask, is easier to figure out. Deep Freeze. I can understand Deep Freeze. I love the way Maximus Mayhem just pushes Miles aside and then we see another part of the Venom vehicle Buzz had used. You can use the spoiler as like a hand glider, just like that. I don't think that was explicitly stated with the toy. It's been a while since I've seen the toy, to be honest. God, thinking about that toy, I had that for years. I had that into the late 90s and I gave it to my friend's son. My friend's son must have been so confused. He had all these random toys from the 80s in his collection. He had Transformers, he had masks. I think I tossed in a few Ninja Turtles in there. This scene here, I mentioned Matt Tracker being written differently. Here especially, he loses his call with Mayhem, gets very angry and very aggressive. That's just not the character we saw in the first season. Even, even when Venom inadvertently kills Scott Tracker for a few minutes, Matt seemed somewhat, Venom will pay for what they did to Scott. In this one, we're talking about a race and the fairness of a race, and Matt is losing his call with Mayhem, who's trying to play mind games with Matt Tracker. So I own a few cells from Mask. The funniest thing is, cells from this episode pop up every once in a while, but from rarely any other episodes. Back in the day, and I've talked about this before, I used to go into the warehouse that housed all of the filmation cells, like from every episode of He-Man, Brave Star, Fat Albert, you name it. And these boxes were all in production order. And you think, what's the relevance of this to a Mask commentary? Well, that warehouse also had a bunch of Deke cartoons in. I only found that out much later. And the funniest thing is, for the longest time, I was led to believe that Japanese animation cells didn't last as long as American animation cells. And I'd seen over the years Japanese cells for sale, particularly from the real Ghostbusters cartoon. And I would notice on certain cells that the lineup was browning slightly. And I considered myself a connoisseur of animation art collecting. I've been doing it for well over 25 years. It wouldn't be until roughly 2016, 2017 that I got my first Japanese animation cell from the real Ghostbusters cartoon. I was shocked at how good the quality of the cell was. And it, it frustrated me because I was in a warehouse where I saw boxes and boxes of cells from Mask, from the real Ghostbusters, from all these deep cartoons, and I passed them by because I thought, as much as I love these shows, it's pointless collecting that animation up. Cut to now, I own a lot of cells from the real Ghostbusters, but also I do own a few from Mask now. This race is pretty awesome, very well directed, and they use one of the best pieces of music that the legendary Shooky Levy composed for this series. I just wish, to some extent, the music wasn't in place or that they had boosted the sound of the cars because you really want to hear those Formula One engines roaring along. Coming up, we see a crowd shot. Listen to the people cheering and celebrating. My ear always picks up, it's close, it's close, Fat Belly's got the lead. I'm like, Fat Belly? I don't think the voice actor is saying that, but it certainly sounds to me like they're calling Miles Mayhem Fat Belly, I, I don't know. Let me know what you think it is. Listen to that piece again and tell me what you think it is. So yeah, Matt Tracker has won the race, hurrah! And he will get the secret formula. So yeah, as I mentioned before, these races would end with the heroes winning a trophy, but in line with the trophy, there was like a secret, like a secret formula or an antidote for something. There was always something tied in with it. Oh, Mayhem is annoyed now. But yeah, I admire what they tried to do in season two. Yes, they were catering to the toy company. Push these toys, turn it into a racing season because that's primarily what we're doing with the toy line. But yeah, I feel that the writers, Jack Alaska and Ray Dryden did their best. And I, there's something about this season I like a lot. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just the fact that it is different. Maybe the fact that it, it's because it makes the dramatic change. And yeah, so season two of Mask, I'll probably cover this in a video 
where I talk about all the changes in depth and showcase more examples. And I'll probably do another episode commentary at some point. I think it has value. Again, I can understand why Mask fans may not like it. I mean, it's nowhere near as good as the first season. That season is full of characters and really, really wonderful stories. This season is quite linear in its storytelling. It's just A to B, literally, start to finish, which is the race. <laughs> but I think Jack Alaska and Ray Dryden did their best to meet the requirements of the toy company. So Kenner would have said, we want 10 more episodes of Mask. It needs to be based around these vehicles. The theme of this wave of toys is racing go for it and so you've got Jack Alaska and Ray Dryden musing and thinking well okay we'll we'll try and work Venom the terrorist organization into a racing season and this is what I mean the episode just ends with the villains driving away you think this is Venom and Mask they would battle till the very end and then Mayhem and his associates would flee because the day is lost here they just lost a race what's to stop them just going over to the mask vehicles and trashing them or something it's it's weird the way this season changes everything. The PSAs in this second season were odd, in a weirdly good way. All the heroes basically seem to live together in Matt Tracker's mansion, and all the Venom agents seem to live together in a huge mansion that belonged to Miles Mayhem, which kind of proved that crime does pay. There's one particular PSA where Slyrax and Bruno Shepard are doing garden chores, but it looks like they all live in this luxury mansion. My favorite of the PSAs features Nevada Rushmore, Jacques Lefleur and a puppy. We'll get there one day. It cannot be ignored that this season is such a departure from what we had before. But yeah, hopefully in another commentary I'll cover it. Maybe I'll even do High Noon and just sit there pointing out all the animation errors. That episode blows my mind. Visually really nice at times, but riddled with errors. And that's the end of this episode commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe and I will catch you on the next one.